Hello and welcome to the second video discussing section 5.3 of the OpenStax chemistry text. Today we will discuss we will be continuing our discussion on enthalpy. Specifically, we're going to begin with what's known as the standard enthalpy of formation. So up to now we've talked about enthalpy, enthalpy being the sum of the system's internal energy, the enthalpy of a system being the sum of the system's internal energy and the product of the pressure and volume of the system. We defined a certain sets of conditions and talked about things at constant pressure and we defined this idea of standard state. So delta H naught was defined as the standard uh, standard state enthalpy was the not here defined it as the standard state and this meant one bar and one mole. So today we'll be introducing the standard enthalpy of formation. This is a very, this is another subclass of enthalpy as general. This is the enthalpy change for a reaction in which exactly one mole of a pure substance is formed from free elements in the most stable states under standard state conditions. So, we're talking about things that are forming, we're talking about a substance forming from its elemental forms under standard state conditions. We have to give an example for this to really describe it. We saw it earlier in the section when we were describing the um, formation of water from oxygen and hydrogen. And we had this idea that one mole of hydrogen and half a mole of oxygen, gas, remember those are the elemental forms, O2 and H2, combine to give one mole of H2O. So that production of one mole of H2O was being formed from the elemental states of eight, uh, the elemental forms of H2 and O2 at standard state. These can be used to compute or to predict the enthalpy changes from chemical reactions that are for impractical or dangerous processes or things that are difficult to make measurements. So we can use the values for the standard state, standard enthalpy of formations to calculate values for reactions that we haven't even done yet based on purely the information about the substances in the reaction and the products of those reactions. So if we have values for appropriate standard uh, enthalpies of formation, we can determine the enthalpy change for any reaction. This is what we're going to be talking about in our discussion of Hess's law. So, as an example, the standard enthalpy for a formation of CO2 is negative 393.5 kilojoules per mole. What does that mean? For one mole of CO2 being formed, to form one mole of CO2 under standard conditions, From elemental, uh, from, from elements, elements, right? Then negative three hundred and ninety three point five kilojoules of energy are released. So, so 300, sorry, it's not negative. 393.5 kilo, kilojoules of energy are released. Well, we're saying that to form this, this is a thermochemical equation, then the change in enthalpy is negative 393.5 kilojoules. How do, we, how do we have this? Well, starting with the reactants, these are the reactants, and they are in their elemental forms. At standard state, under standard state, carbon is a black solid, oxygen is a gas. And if they react, so if we burn a piece of carbon, 
with oxygen gas under standard state conditions. Negative 393.5 kilojoules is how much energy the system loses. Starting with the reactants at a pressure of 1 atm and 298.15 kelvin and ending with one mole of CO2, also at 1 atm and 25 degrees Celsius, it wouldn't fall, I suppose you'd be more of that. Then there is a change of 393.5 kilojoules. Now, for NO2, we'll also bring that from the elemental forms, N2 and O2. Remember, these are uh, diatomic molecules under standard state conditions at 298. And um, one bar, you would have nitrogen as a gas and oxygen as a gas. And to form this, it would require 33.2 kilojoules. To form one mole, it's endothermic, and so that's a positive number. Okay, And so we have these, these sort of thermochemical equations under standard states for the formation of these molecules. And we can use that knowledge to talk about reactions in general. So we have a list, we have lists and lists of these values. We have some that are highly exothermic, really, really negative, some that are very endothermic, really positive. By definition, the standard enthalpy of formation of an element in its most stable form is equal to zero under standard conditions. Say, say that again. By definition, the standard enthalpy of formation for an element, for any of these things, these, these elemental forms, these things are going to be zero under standard conditions, which is one ATM for gases and one molarity for solutions. So, as an example, evaluating the enthalpy of formation. Well, ozone forms from oxygen by an endothermic process. Energy is being put in. Ultraviolet radiation is being absorbed. That's where this energy is coming from. And it drives the reaction forward, producing that ozone. Now, assuming that both of these things are in their standard state, determine the standard enthalpy of formation of delta HF under standard conditions of ozone, right? The, so the standard enthalpy of formation of ozone from this end formation. Well, this is the standard enthalpy of formation for one mole of a substance. We are given it for two moles of ozone and three moles of oxygen reacting to form the two moles of ozone. And that gives us 286 kilojoules. But what we're wanting, what we're wanting, is to talk about the formation of ozone, one mole of ozone. So we would divide this by two, dividing all of these things by two, giving us the reaction, giving us the reaction, three halves O2 forms one, three half moles of O2 form one mole of O3. And since we manipulated the coefficients by dividing by two, we will also divide the enthalpy of that reaction by two to talk about it in terms of one mole of ozone being produced. So we see then that one, the standard enthalpy of formation for ozone is going to be 143 kilojoules per mole. And if we were to form two moles, as seen in this equation, we would have two, 286 kilojoules. Okay. So how do we go about writing the equations for the delta H of formation? Well, given a compound, right, something made up of multiple types of elements, C2H5OH, well, this is ethanol. We have to make it from its elemental constituents. So for one mole of ethanol, 
We have to define what it's made up of and how many of those things we would have to have to produce one mole. So C2H5OH is made out of, so one mole of this is made out of two moles of carbon, five moles of hydrogen, nope, five plus one, that's six moles of hydrogen, and one mole of oxygen. However, H and O do not exist in those elemental forms. And so this is H2, so that's three moles of H2 and one half moles of O2. So we have to put it in terms of its elemental forms. Now we would say that two moles, or so we would say two carbon, and that's a solid, plus three H2, and that's a gas under standard conditions, plus one half O2, which is also a gas, provides one mole of C2H5OH, which is a liquid under standard state conditions. And this would be our equation. We'll we're just break it down into its elemental components, define those in terms of their standard state, right? In terms of how they exist under standard state conditions, and then write that as an equation. Okay, well, moving on to this idea called Hess's Law that we've already, really we've already been exploring. But now we get to define it and we get to show how we can use it and use it within those conventions that we have defined already. So there are two ways to determine the amount of heat in a chemical change. We can measure an experiment or experimentally or we can calculate it from other experimentally determined enthalpy change. So once we know the change in the enthalpy, we can use that knowledge to calculate the changes in enthalpy as to things that are related. For some reactions, it's very difficult to investigate, to make accurate measurements because it's just it's really hard to set up the standards for standard state. It's really hard to make some of those measurements. And even when a reaction is not hard to perform a measure, it is convenient to be able to determine the heat without the heat involved in the reaction without performing the experiment. It's just easier to sit there and do some math than it is to actually go in and set the experiment up and measure it. But having explored this enough, we know that the, the math should meet the experiment within the uncertainty provided by the experimental apparatus. Or within the uncertainty that was provided within the experimental apparatus which were used to develop the experimentally determined data from which we're doing our calculations, right? So there's always this um, back and forth between the empirical evidence and the theoretical framework that we're performing it within. So, the type of calculation usually involved the use of Hess's law. So we need to state this definition. Hess's law, I'm not going to write it on the board, but if a process can be written as the sum of several stepwise processes, if we can break down a more complex system into a bunch of simpler processes, several stepwise processes, the enthalpy change of the total process equals the sum of the enthalpy changes of the various steps. Right. Why is this, why does this work? Well, remember, we define the enthalpy as a state function that depends only upon the state that it is in. Well, if we take these individual steps, as long as they all fit together to provide that whole picture, it doesn't matter which steps we took, as long as they give us that, as long as we reach that final state. It only depends on where a chemical process starts and ends, but not upon the path it takes to get from the start to the finish. As an example, 
We can talk about the reaction of carbon with oxygen to form carbon dioxide, as we've done here. Right? This is the enthalpy of formation, or this is a reaction of formation of carbon dioxide. Yet, we can also talk about it as a two-step process, where first we produce carbon monoxide, and then carbon monoxide reacts with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide. This is the enthalpy of formation for carbon monoxide. This is the enthalpy of formation, or this is the enthalpy of the reaction. Right? It's not the enthalpy of formation because this is not an elemental form. This is a molecule here. Right? This is a, a compound. And this is a molecule too. This is a compound that's got multiple elements. It's not an elemental form. Right? But this is produced from elemental forms. And so if we took these two things and added them together, right? if we took C plus one half O2, and this is a solid, and this is a gas, and this is providing CO as a gas, and then we take carbon monoxide as a gas, and we react it with another half mole of the oxygen, we will wind up with CO2 as a gas. But if we add these things together, air carbon monoxides cancel out. We wind up with carbon as a solid, plus one mole of O2 gives us CO2 as a solid. Well, how do we go about manipulating these values? Well, we see that we had with both of these, I should be writing it on that side, but I've not left myself enough, enough room. Delta H is negative uh, 111 kilojoules for this. Delta H for this is equal to negative 283. Three kilojoules. Kilojoules, right? Well, when we add these together, we will find that the delta H for this overall reaction is the sum. So that's negative 394 kilojoules. Negative 283 plus negative 111 is negative 394. Right, why can we do this? Well, because this is being produced, but then it's being reacted. Right? And the overall reaction is the reaction of the elemental form of, of the elemental forms providing that molecule. According to Hess's law, the enthalpy change of the reaction will equal the sum of the enthalpy changes of the steps. Well now, if we know the enthalpy changes of the steps, and we can use those steps to create the reaction, we have now figured out a way to calculate the enthalpy change for the reaction without ever having to actually do it. That's nice. Just get to sit there at the computer and play, play around on a spreadsheet. Right? We can apply the data from experimental enthalpies of combustion to find the enthalpy change for the entire reaction from those steps as a graphical image, so working in the symbolic form, trying to show us what we mean here. For, for in, this is true in general for chemical and physical processes, right? That it doesn't matter how you get there, it's just the start and finish difference. So you can go from these things to forming CO, which then reacts to form CO2, or you can just straight talk about it from this initial state to the final state. Either way, you will have the same change in energy, the same change in the enthalpy. Doesn't matter how you get there, just the state that you wind up in. This is directly proportional to the quantities of reactants or products. Remember that second statement that we made that um, if we multiply, if we multiply the coefficients of the reaction, we multiply the enthalpy because the enthalpy is defined as for that reaction. And if we change the reaction, we have to change the enthalpy. If we divide the amount that we have in the reaction, we divide the enthalpy. Why? It is an extensive property. It depends upon how much there is. But by dividing it by moles, we can turn it into an intensive property. 
So if we know that one half N2 plus one mole of O2 forms one mole of NO2, then we know that, and that, that the change in enthalpy is 33.2 kilojoules. Well, we know if we multiply this by two, we will get twice that change in enthalpy. It will take twice that amount of energy. In general, if we multiply and divide an equation by the number, then the enthalpy should also be multiplied and divided by that same number. Also, the other thing that we had, the other statement we had made earlier is that if we flip a reaction, if we talk about the reverse reaction, instead of things coming together to form this new thing, we can talk about this new thing breaking up into its components. Well, the change in enthalpy is just going to have the opposite side. Right? It's, it's the law of conservation of energy. The forward reaction is going to be reverse the negative reaction. Right? For the reverse reaction, the enthalpy change is also reversed. As an example, if we want to determine the enthalpy of formation from standard state from its elemental forms of iron trichloride, from the enthalpy changes, you know, iron, not the iron trichloride, iron, uh, iron three chloride, right? That iron has an Fe3 plus there. And chlorine is a negative one, so it's, uh, yeah. Um, from the enthalpy changes of the following two step processes that occur under standard state conditions, if we know these processes, we can manipulate these two equations to figure out the enthalpy of formation, but how do we change those equations? How do we manipulate them? Well, this is a solid, that's its gaseous state, that's good. This is, I mean, this is a solid that's in standard state. This is a gas that's in standard state. But this is not what we're wanting. We're wanting this FeCl3, but we can make that from this. So if we react that with more chlorine, we will get FeCl3. If we know the enthalpy for this and this, we can add these two equations together. Iron 2 chloride will cancel out. We'll wind up with Fe S plus 3 half Cl2 gives 1 mole of FeCl3. We would then add these together. In adding those together, negative 341.8 kilojoules plus negative 57.7 kilojoules gives us negative 399.5 kilojoules per mole cool thing about that, that's the enthalpy of formation. We can check that. Up by going to appendix. Standard thermodynamic properties for selected substances. We've got listed here in this column the standard enthalpies of formation. So the standard change in enthalpy for formation of these things, and we scroll on down to iron 3 chloride, hoping that it's here, at BCL3, and we see that it's negative 399.49. That's wonderful. Error calculations there, error calculations from those two other equations provided the overall change in enthalpy. Math works. That symbolic form provides some insight into the objective reality. So, a second example. This is a check your learning problem here. If we want to calculate delta H from this process, knowing these pieces of information, well, we have to be able to make this from these equations, N2, 2NO, NO, 1 half O, we've got NO2. Well, we want 2NO2, so we know that we have to multiply this by 2. So let's, let's try to draw this out. N2, and this is a gas, plus O2, which is a gas, goes to 
2 and O. This is what we're wanting to get. N2 plus 2O2 as a gas goes to 2 and O2 as a gas. Now I'm going to get rid of the gas because everything we're working with here is that. So N2 plus O2 goes to 2NO, and this has a delta H of 180.5 kilojoules. This is a thermochemical equation. We also have the thermochemical equation that NO plus 1 half O2 goes to NO2. And this is a thermochemical equation. This is equal to negative 57.06 kilojoules. Well, if we multiply this by 2, this entire thing by 2, let's distribute. So multiplying this by 2 gives us that. Multiplying this by 2 gives us 1. And multiplying this by 2 gives us 2 of those. Well, in doing that, We can now add these together, but what do we have to do? We have to also multiply this by 2. When we add these together, we see 2 and O's cancel out. We wind up with N2 plus 2O2 gives us, gives us 2NO2. And therefore, delta H for this is going to be 180.5 plus 2 times negative 57.06 kilojoules. All these things have kilojoules there. And so delta H is equal to 66.4. One eighty minus this is like what uh, one fourteen. One eighty minus about one fourteen something. That gives us sixty six point four kilojoules. Okay, now we can make this more complicated. We can talk about multiple reactions. We may have to flip the reaction, and in flipping it, we would change the sign. So it's going to be on you to look a little bit deeper into this, right? To manipulate these sorts of equations to determine the overall enthalpy of a bigger example. So in this one, we can multiply the third reaction by one half changing the delta H also by one half. So, so let's just look at this and how we would get this equation. Okay, we want ClF as a, as a reactant. We want F2 as a reactant. We want ClF3 as a product. Well, we have ClF3 in this equation, and that's the only place it exists at. But we have it as a reactant. We want it to be a product, so we would flip this. But in flipping this, we have to change the sign. And flipping it, we get this as a product. That's great. Well, we have 2OF2 in this reaction, but we won't want that. But we see that we have OF2 over here. Well, we can get rid of these two when we add these equations together by multiplying this by two. If we multiply this by two, that will give us four of these. So that's not the way to go, because we only want one of those. But we can get one of these by dividing this by two. Um, do, 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 do. Let me come see here. CLF plus F2. Oh, nope. Uh, we want the CLF on this side. And this is a CLF, okay? We want the F2 on this side. Well, where does F2 show up? F2 only shows up here. So we may have to flip this equation over. And if we flip this equation over, yes, yes, if we flip this equation over, we get our F2, but we have to divide it in half to only get one F2. So we can flip it, changing the sign, divide it by two in order to change that to the one that we need. And then we would divide this by two.
So about the way that I would approach this, the way I really draw out my Hess's Law questions, and you can do it as the book does, or as I do, or come up with your own way that makes sense to you. So we want to get, we want to add these things together in some way to get um, CLF plus F2, and we need to keep our types down here, the state of these things, CLF3 as a gas. Now I'm just going to write our delta H's for the reactions as 1, 2, and 3. Our reactions are 2, O, oh, well, I guess we've got them as 2, 3, and 4 here. 2, 3, 4. I'm using Roman numerals. It's a little easier for me to keep track of. Um, 2, O, F, 2 as a gas goes to O2 plus F2. These are both gases. We have two of these being produced. Okay. We have two ClF as a gas plus O2 as a gas going to Cl2O gas plus OF2 also a gas. ClF3 as a gas plus O2 as a gas goes to one half Cl2O gas plus three halves OF2 also gases. So ClF3 or well, ClF, let's see, where do we get this from? This thing is present in CLF. It's found right here. And that's the only place I'm seeing it. F2 is found right here. So that sort of lets us know that we're going to have to reverse this reaction. And in reversing this reaction, we put a negative there. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's reverse that reaction. So we draw it the opposite way. And I'll do this in red to show that we've made a change. Now what was that change? Well, we changed in the orders. That's 2F2 plus O2. And these are both gases. Is giving us 2OF2 also a gas. Okay, well that's great. That's, that's that. that puts our F2 in the right spot. Now, where do we get the ClF3 from? Well, we see ClF3 showing up right here. Oh gosh, well what does that mean? That means we have to do a negative on this reaction as well because this is a reactant. We want it to be a product. So we change the direction of this thing. Okay. How do we change the direction? Well, we just write the products on this side and the reactants on the other. Right? We change the direction of that arrow. Okay, and that was to make sure that we have ClF3 as a gas. That's good. Now we have this right here, we've got this right here, and we've got this here, yet we don't have our molar values correctly. So, what can we do? We can multiply all of this by one half. We can multiply all of this by one half. If we distribute that one half through, and I like to open this side and start distributing. One over two. Well, that changes this to a one. That changes this to a one half. And that changes this to a one. And that's distributed. 
I open up this side. This is a one half. 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 And this is a one. So we don't have to include it as a one. Okay, let's see if we add these things together if this is what we get. F2, that's good. Plus one half O2. So let's, um, how do we want to do this? I'll put myself a separation between these two. We have F2 plus one half O2 plus CLF plus one half O2 plus one half Cl2 O plus three halves O F two goes to O F two plus one half Cl2 O plus one half O F two plus and I've got down here and I've almost run out of room Cl F three you can't see that plus Cl F three plus O two Okay, well, 1 half O2 plus 1 half O2 is 102. We've got 102 on each side, so we can cancel that out. Okay, we've got 1 half Cl2O on this side, and that cancels out over there. We've got 3 halves OF2 on this side, and we have 1 and 1 half. These will cancel out on those sides. What do we wind up with? We wind up with F2, CLF, and CLF3, which is what we were trying to get to. How did we get there though? What's the delta H? The delta H of this first reaction, this, this reaction right here, is going to be the sum of these. So that's negative one half delta H2 plus one half delta H3 minus delta H4. Hopefully you can see that over there. Right? We've manipulated these and then we added them together to get the overall enthalpy of the reaction that we were trying to get to. And that is Hess's law in a nutshell. I mean, that's about the only way you can really approach it. What did we have here? We had to add these together in a way. We had to manipulate them by flipping them, manipulate them by multiplying the coefficients and multiplying, therefore, the enthalpy of that reaction. And we had to do all of this as a sum of the enthalpies when we added those together to get the reaction of interest. So we can also use Hess's law to determine the enthalpy change of any reaction if the corresponding enthalpies of formation of the reactants and products are available. If we have a list of formation values, the enthalpy of formation values, which we do, that we just looked at in the back of the book, right? If we have that list and we know the enthalpies of formation of those individual constituents, we can also determine the enthalpy of formation for the overall equation. Right? The stepwise reactions we're considering, because that's what Hess's has, has law is about, breaking up this bigger reaction into stepwise components. We're talking about this reaction as being stepwise processes. Well, what are we talking about? We're talking about the decomposition of the reactants into their elemental forms, into the component elements, for which the enthalpy changes are proportional to the negative of the enthalpies of the formation of the reactants. And then this is followed by recombining those elements, remember, by conservation of mass, we're just rearranging how these elements are combined with each other. And so recombining those elements to give the products with enthalpies of change form proportional to the enthalpies of formation of the products. So therefore, the standard enthalpy change of the overall reaction is going to be equal to the sum of the standard enthalpies of formation of the products plus the sum of the negatives of the standard enthalpies of formation of the reactants. We're taking the reactants, we're breaking those up. That's the negative enthalpy of formation. We're decomposing them into the elemental forms. But then we're taking those elemental forms and recombining them to get the products. That is the definition of the standard enthalpy of formation. So therefore, 
the standard reaction enthalpy is going to be the sum weighted, of course, by how many of those there are, because these values depend upon how much there is. And this standard enthalpy of formation is talking about one mole. So if we have two moles, we have to multiply that by two. Right? So we're forming the products, having subtracted the energy of breaking up those reactants. This, in my mind, is just absolutely beautiful. This is the pure definition of conservation of energy and conservation of mass working together here. Right? That the energy that is the enthalpy of those reactants is being broken up and then reformed. We're taking those components, breaking them up, and then changing the order and putting them back together to form the products. And we've got a way to define the energy change that is associated with those individual stepwise pieces and therefore the overall for the reaction. So, as an example, for the standard enthalpy change of the reaction that is provided here, For the reaction 3NO2 as a gas plus H2O as a liquid goes to 2HNO3 aqueous plus NO as a gas. Well, we have to break these down into the enthalpies of formations. When we talk about the enthalpy of formation, we've got N2 plus so we've got N2, one half, N2 plus O2 gives us NO2. And we have the delta H formation for that. We have um, one, we have H2 plus one half O2 gives us H2O. And that's a delta H formation for that. We have two H and O3 that is forming from um, H2 plus N2 plus, is that NO3, so that's uh, 3 O2 gives us 2 H N O3. Now this is uh, not, not broken down into a one molar thing, so let's go make that, let's, let's first talk about the enthalpy formation of this species, which is one half of H2, one half of N2, three halves of O2. Okay? That's that one, that one, that one. This last one is NO, so that's one half N2 plus one half O2 gives us one mole of NO. Now this has to be aqueous, this has to be a liquid, or is that a gas? Sorry. This has to be a gas so that we get the right values. NO2 is also is going to be a gas here. So we have a delta H formation for each of these equations under standard states. Now we can, or we must, go to a, a table of values. Let's find these things. So, for NO2, LMNO2, and as a gas, 33.2 kilojoules. I'm going to write it over here because I'm bad for just writing things where I want to. 33 kilojoules. 33.2. Okay, that's for, oh, is that, yeah, that's NO2. Now this is H2O as a gas. So, water, uh, that's mercury, water is going to be,
There we are. As a gas, it's negative 241.82. HNO3 is right here and this is aqueous oh no oh okay so this is aqueous and in order to get the aqueous form we have to talk about it as uh, one half H2 as the gas going to oh we want H plus and we want oh gosh we want NO3 as uh, as a minus and so that's uh, I don't know if they have it in this table, they have to. Uh, oh, oh, maybe it's... Control F, H, N, O, 3. Okay, well then, N, O, 3. NO3 minus aqueous is negative 205. So because that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about H plus and NO3 minus. NO3 minus is a negative 205. So we've got a Hess's law problem inside of a Hess's law problem. And if we talk, find hydrogen as a gas, uh, H plus aqueous, that's a zero. So we can talk about this as being the NO3 minus aqueous. Uh, I think we get the NO. It's Let's look at our values that we did get. 33.2 kilojoules per mole of NO2. That's right. And we have to convert it using the fact that we have three moles in our initial reaction, so we multiply it by three. We add that with the amount that comes from the water. We add that, which is negative 285. Oh, gosh, what did I do? I got water as a liquid. I thought I had water as a gas there. Do they have water as a liquid or a gas? Oh, I wrote it down wrong. That's supposed to say it's supposed to be a liquid. And so I wrote down the wrong value. Oh. That's supposed to be a liquid. See, the state, it's state dependent. It depends upon whether it's a liquid or a gas. And I got the wrong one from that table. Okay, but we talked about HNO3 and it's apparently negative 207.4 kilojoules and I'm not sure where exactly they got that. Um, so the H doesn't matter, but the NO3 does, and that 207.4. What is that? 207.4. Formation, let's see, where are we at? Standard thermodynamic properties. I know this is probably a little bit dizzy. F N O three. 
boom, boom, boom. Yes, negative 205, which is the value Nope, they got 207.4. Uh, there's a 2.4 that I'm missing somewhere. I'm in Appendix G here. Three is liquid, H no three is a gas. It has to be coming from that hydrogen. The hydrogen is zero. I've messed up somewhere and I apologize, but I hope that the, the concept is coming through. That two moles times the per mole of the reaction of the formation of this plus that, right? We're adding together, we're adding together the enthalpies of formation represented by the formate the, the molar weighted formation of these, and we're subtracting the enthalpy is a formation of this. We can write this reaction as the sum of the decompositions of these things. Sum of the decompositions of these things and the formations of these things, which is what I was trying to do right here. And I was getting stuck in this which for some reason they've got two times delta H formation the formation of the H and the three, but I can't find this value. I don't know where it's coming from there. But I mean the concept still holds. Okay. When we add those, when we manipulate those and add those together, having flipped some in order to get them as reactants and having left others as they were to get them as the products and then canceling out the things that have in common. It's an example of Hess's law, right? We wind up with the overall enthalpy of the reaction. So I'm probably going to have to redo a version of this later on, but I don't have the time at the moment. I've got to keep moving ahead and so do you. So let's just real quick summary. If a chemical change is carried out at constant pressure, the only, and the only work done is caused by expansion or contraction, then Q is called the enthalpy of change. The heat is going to be the enthalpy of change. The heat change is the enthalpy, right? Call it delta H. For standard conditions at one, eight, at one bar of pressure and 298.15 Kelvin, we would write it as this. The value for reaction is in one direction is equal in magnitude, but opposite in sign for the reverse reaction. Delta H is directly proportional to the amount. It's extensive, right? Examples of enthalpy changes include enthalpy of combustion, enthalpy of fusion, enthalpy of vaporization, and the standard enthalpy of formation. So physical and chemical changes. The standard enthalpy of formation is the enthalpy accompanying the formation of one mole of a substance from the elements in their most stable states at standard pressure, one bar. Many of these are carried out at a given temperature, which is 25 Celsius, 298.15 Kelvin. If the enthalpies of formation through the reactants and products of a reaction are available, we can use those and the concept introduced by Hess's law in order to write that process as the sum of several stepwise processes allowing the total process is, um, enthalpy of reaction to be determined from the sum of those stepwise processes. 
only a few key equations, but a lot of depth available within these equations. Lots of exercises. Let's look at some of these definitions that were provided here. We talked a lot about those in that summary, right? Chemical thermodynamics, that's just in general what we've been studying, the thermodynamics of chemistry. Enthalpy, the enthalpy change. The enthalpy is the sum of the system's internal energy and the mathematical product of the pressure and volume, UPV, U plus PV, right? Um, expansion work is, is expansion or contraction against an external pressure. We went over the first law of thermodynamics. The internal energy of a system changes due to the heat flow in or out of the system or work done on or by the system that the, the energy is being conserved between the system and the surrounding. As is law, we've talked about hydrocarbons. I'm not sure why it's an example here. It's composed of only hydrogen and carbon. Uh, Hess's law, the sum of the individual steps add up to the whole thing, then the enthalpy change is the sum of the enthalpy changes of those steps. The internal energy is the total of all kinds of energy present in the substance. The standard enthalpy of combustion is talked about it in terms of one under standard conditions, the combustion of one mole. We already defined that a little bit earlier. Then we defined the standard state, one bar of pressure, usually at temperatures of 298.15, and that's denoted with subscript 298. The state function, extremely important concept here. This is a property that depends upon only the state of the system. Whether it is here versus here, doesn't matter how it got there. The amount of internal energy is still going to be the same. It only depends upon the state and that's all I have for you for section 5.3 and chapter 5 as a whole. See you in the next chapter.